We're on the porch of God's country place, and we're talking about what we usually talk about, salvation, truth, love, happiness, transformation, <laughs> resentments, greed, distraction, chaos, death, the philosophy of singularity, the great philosophers, and everything else that goes with all of the meanderings that our mind presents us with and the certainty that this transformation is coming about. But we, the discussion came up because we put onto the tape Lesson 192 yesterday, of course, which says, I have a function that God would have me fulfill, which seems very reasonable to a mind. It says, hey, I've got a function that God, whatever he is, wants me to fulfill. What an important admission. I mean, the whole idea that you, individually, have value in the universe is an astonishing thing, and you like that. <laughs> huh? Because you have the power in your mind to say, oh, wow, God God wants me to be a, a successful businessman. God wants me to be a housewife. And God wants me to suffer pain and die on the cross. <laughs> wow, whoops. God wants me to do all these things. And, and you feel real good about it, and suddenly you look at what lesson 193, is it 193? It's that. It says your function is only forgiveness. Oh, boo. What do you mean only forgiveness? Your function on earth is only to relinquish judgment of yourself in relationship to your falsity. That's the only function that you have. And you say, well, I must have some other value. I, I must be with something. After all, I love and hate and I get old and I die. And I'm here to tell you no. No, no, no. Your function is to experience the transformation, the maturation of your mind to forgiveness, to the relinquishment of associated ideas that hold you in the bondage of space-time. That's literally true. So if I say, hey, Marty, teacher, how are you doing with your forgiveness? And you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm working on some resentments that I have. Well, finally that begins to get kind of silly, doesn't it? Okay, we have made a statement of what? Subjective reality. We've made a statement that your mind is responsible for this. When you say to me, I'm working on a resentment, well, all you're really saying to me is I'm working on my own conflict. I'm working on not defending myself from my own thoughts about myself. It finally it gets silly. It's a con game. All requirements for advanced teachers who come to me are that they see immediately that the whole nature of perceptual reality is a resentment. It's literally a grievance or holding on to the idea that you can be attacked, the idea that you need to defend yourself, right? And that's really the statement that we're making, that there's no necessity for you to do it. We may have jumped the gun a little bit with this forgiveness lesson. Okay. We're teaching to the certainty that salvation in, is, is in non-judgment or quite literally the surrender of the battle of existence. Okay, we don't use that word a lot because you know, somehow the idea that you are under no laws but God's or that the will of God is all you need pertain to somehow seems to deride the notion that all power is in your mind. They appear to be paradoxical. So we make the assertion that the power to absolutely forgive is in your mind since you created the illusion of resentment, pain, and death initially. Okay. But now we're going to back up just a moment because I did put, and this is from the workbook of the Course in Miracles for those of you who aren't familiar with it, of Jesus Christ, scribed from total reality or heaven into the death and chaos that constitutes your apparent reality. We read yesterday, Lesson 192, I have a function God would have me fulfill, and that function is only to not judge, to back away, but we better back up just one, one lesson here now, okay? Because the previous lesson is the proclamation that you are God creating, or that you, your mind literally is whole and singular. Okay, let's do then, and let's look at, for you guys with your workbooks, let's look at 191, 192, and 193 in the workbook. 
191 will say what? I am the Holy Son of God himself. It's a declaration of what you are. 192 says what your function is. If you are, if you are indeed in limited consciousness. 192 says your function is only to relinquish false judgment of yourself so you can see that you are the Holy Son of God. What happens in 193? 193 says a direct manner of doing it is the admission that all things are lessons God would have me learn. This is a literal truth. It's your capacity each moment within your apparent perceptual reality to see that every single thing that you do can be directed and must be directed to what? The lesson of fulfilling your function of forgiveness through the declaration that you are the holy living son of God. You have an idea that the workbook of the course is not constructed in this manner. I assure you that it is. Okay. I assure you that if you have a function of that is only the possibility and fulfillment of the forgiveness or non-judgment of yourself in relationship with God and everything else, that the, the declaration of your wholeness will always proceed it and does. Now you listen to me. And we're going to do what? Lesson 191. What an incredible statement. I am the Holy Son of God himself. Does that mean God himself or Son himself? It means both. It means that I am God creating, and it says I am the Holy Son, and later on it'll say I am the only Son. You want to hear that? Here's the declaration of release from bondage of the world. I am the Holy Son of God himself. Here's the declaration of release from the bondage of my perceptual judgment of myself in association with pain and death. This is how I get out of it. And here as well is all the world released. What the heck does that mean? All the world is released. Does that mean, okay, that if I release judgment of myself in association with my projections, that everything in the world must be released with me? Huh? You want to listen to what this says? You do not see what you have done by giving to the world the role of a jailer to the Son of God. What could it be but vicious and afraid, fearful of shadows, punitive and wild, lacking of reason, blind and sane with hate? Wow, he described a human being. Of course. Because the perceptual protection of yourself is the indication of your weakness and vulnerability. And so you defend yourself and attack your brother. Here is the proclamation of non-defense that brings about the realization of singular consciousness. What have you done that this should be your world? Wherever you go today, if you run into somebody on the street, walk up to them and say, boy, there's sure a lot of pain and grief and death going on here. Uh, what have we done to deserve this? What you're, what you're presenting is the admission that you're sharing a mutual guilt. Okay, that you must have done something for all of this dreck and all of this stuff to be going on in action. And he's going to give you all kinds of answers, all of which, as Master Jesus would say, are loony, are, are ridiculous. He'll give you answers that range all the way from, uh, well, we sinned, okay, as though somehow you could really be sinful and, since you were created by God whole. Or that God is testing us as though somehow God uh, is punitive and is going to punish us. And all, you'll get all of the ridiculous statements okay, and responses to the question, what have you done that this should be your world? What have you done that this is what you see? Okay? Here's the answer. If you deny your own identity, this is what remains. All that will remain is a false illusionary imagery projection of yourself in association with nothing. You look on chaos and proclaim it is yourself. There is no sight that fails to witness this to you. 
There is no sound that does not speak of frailty within you and without. No breath you draw that does not seem to bring you nearer death. No hope you hold but will dissolve in tears. And if that's not a definition of what the human mind is and your association is here, I don't know what it is. Huh? No wonder you're fearful. Huh? We've said many times before, my loved ones, that you sit in association with love and tenderness and gentleness directly alongside with pain and fear and greed and hate and envy. Right? And you live with these things all around you in your perception. Deny your own identity and you will not escape the madness which induced this weird, unnatural, and ghostly thought that mocks creation and that laughs at God. Deny your own identity and you assail the universe alone, without a friend, a tiny particle of dust against the legions of your enemies. Deny your own identity and look on evil, sin, and death and watch despair snatch from your fingers every scrap of hope, leaving you nothing but the wish to die. Boy, that's lovely stuff. Why does this occur? Why does it seem to be that way? Because within the power of your mind, you have denied your own reality. Okay, there's a little philosophy involved in this, isn't there? And that's okay. Because you're walking around within your own dream illusion. You are, a, you are the walking certainty of the denial of the power of your own mind. You have intentionally constructed a conflictual relationship with yourself. What an astonishing thing to do. Huh? Yet what is it except a game you play in which identity can be denied? You listen to me. You are as God created you. Everything is as God created. All else but this one thing is folly to believe. In this one thought is everything set free. In this one truth are all illusions gone. In this one fact is sinlessness proclaimed to be forever part of everything. The central core of its existence and its guarantee of immortality. You cannot be different than everything. That's what this says. Universal consciousness is singular. You cannot not be that. You can set up all the conflicts you want, but this is the lesson that you're going to learn. I am the Holy Son of God Himself. Now, you let today's idea find a place among your thoughts, and you have risen far above the world and all the worldly thoughts that hold it prisoner. And from this place of safety and escape, you will return and set it free. For he who can accept his true identity is truly saved, and his salvation is the gift he gives to everyone in gratitude to him who pointed out the way to happiness that changed his whole perspective of the world. Ready? One holy thought like this, and you are free. You are the Holy Son of God himself, and with this holy thought you learn as well that you have freed the world. You have no need to use it cruelly and then perceive this savage need in it. You set it free of your imprisonment, you will not see a devastating image of yourself walking the world in terror with the world twisting in agony because your fears have laid the mark of death upon its heart. Wow. You'd be glad today how very easily is hell undone. You need but tell yourself, I am the Holy Son of God himself. I cannot suffer. I cannot be in pain. I cannot suffer loss nor fail to do all that salvation asks. That's a statement of truth. That's not a statement of possibility. That's not a statement of perceptual judgment in association with fear and evil and death. That's a statement of reality, you guys.
A miracle has lighted up all dark and ancient caverns where the rites of death echoed since time began. For time has lost its hold upon the world. The Son of God has come in glory to redeem the lost, to save the helpless, and to give the world the gift of his forgiveness. Who could see the world as dark and sinful when God's Son has come again at last to set it free? And who is God's Son but you? What is the world but your manifestation of separation? How is the atonement accomplished except by your whole recognition of yourself as of the only living Son of God? Hmm? You listen. You who perceive yourself as weak and frail with futile hopes and devastating dreams, born but to die and to weep and suffer pain, you hear this. All power is given unto you in earth and heaven. There is nothing that you cannot do. You play the game of death, of being helpless and pitifully tied to disillusion in a world which shows no mercy to you. You ready? Yet when you accord it mercy, will its mercy shine on you. Then let the Son of God awaken from his sleep and opening his holy eyes return again to bless the world he made. In error it began, but it will end in the reflection of his holiness. And he will sleep no more and dream of death. You join with me today. Your glory is the light that saves the world. Do not withhold salvation longer. Look about the world and see the suffering there all around you. Is not your heart willing to bring your weary brother rest today? We began this conversation with the idea of forgiveness. Come on. Forgive yourself your own illusions. Your brother waits your own release. Why? You've constructed him in the evil concept of yourself. He'll stay in chains until you are freed. He cannot see the mercy of the world until you find it in yourself. He will suffer pain until you have denied its hold on you. And he will die, and you will die, until you accept your own eternal life. You are the Holy Son of God himself. You remember this, and all of the world is free. You remember this, and earth and heaven. I want. That's where I love you. Mm -hmm. That's the Course in Miracles. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. Lesson 191. I'm the Holy Son of God. 192 we did yesterday. I have a function that God would have me fulfill. Obviously, if you are the Holy Son of God, then your function is only to forgive yourself in your relationship with what you think is outside of you. We're going to come back in just a moment because Lesson 193 is real exciting. It's an all-inclusive lesson that says that all things are lessons that God would have me learn. The application of that gets to be fun because everything that happens to you, you simply put in the parameter of your own what? Enlightenment of your own transformation. Then the world becomes kind of a light place. It, you accept all the things that are occurring in your transformative process as an assertion of the inevitability of your own awakening. We'll be back in just a bit. We're back for just a moment. Because of the nature of the lesson that we're teaching, we're going to have a very short meditation here that's occurring. And you join with us in the assertions that we're making. And I'm going to leave the tape on for just a moment so that you can share with your brothers here in God's place that's revelatory. Be gentle.
I am the Holy Son of God Himself. I am. I am God. I have a function that God would have me fulfill, and I intend to fulfill it now. I intend to work on it now. No more compromise. No more vacillation. No more wishing for death. Everything that's happening to me is part of my awakening process, part of my coming out of the tomb of perception, out of the darkness into the light. Every single thing that could ever occur, I can this instant bring into a full focus of reality through the process of relinquishing my previous association of thoughts. This is what I intend to do. Because all things are lessons that God would have me learn, even though truth in heaven, there, there's nothing to learn. And truth does not know of learning. God does not know of learning. Yet his will extends to what he does not understand in that he wills the happiness his son inherited of him be undisturbed, eternal, and forever gaining scope, eternally expanding in the joy of full creation, and eternally open and wholly limitless in him. This is a lovely, lovely description of the mind, of the mind creating, an artful declaration that you are not limited in your scope and power of self-expression. This is his will, and thus his will must provide the means to guarantee that it be done, and of course it does. Why? Because it's contained within himself. God sees no contradiction. Yet if you are on the earth in perception, you believe that he sees them. Thus he has a need for one who can correct his erring sight, the sun does, and give him vision that will lead him back to where what? To where perception ceases, where there's no necessity for comparison in order to retain the limited consciousness. God does not perceive at all, of course not. Yet it is he who gives the means by which perception is made true and beautiful enough to what? Let the light of heaven shine upon it. Mm -hmm. It is he who answers what his son would contradict. You want to hear that? Mm -hmm. And keeps his sinlessness forever saved. Okay. You cannot escape the will of God cannot escape love, because that is what you are. Now these are the lessons God would have you learn. His will reflects them all, and they reflect his loving kindness to the son he loves. Okay? You notice that we're saying reflect. This is the gathering of the image of the fracturedism, and what you would term the gathering together of the great rays of light that have been diffused by the schism, okay? Now, each lesson, each thought form or pattern has a central thought, but it's the same in all of them. The form alone is changed with different circumstances and events, with different characters and different themes, apparent but not real. Mm -hmm. They are the same in fundamental content. It is this. If you forgive them, you will see them differently. 
This is the process of bringing all of your thoughts through this process of non-identity into the statement of the wholeness of your mind in its creative capacity. Certain it is that all the distress and disease that you feel does not appear to be anything but unforgiveness. Yet that is the content underneath the form. It is this sameness which makes learning sure. Why? Because the lesson is so simple that it cannot be rejected in the end. You listen to me. No one can hide forever from a truth so very obvious that it appears in countless forms and yet is recognized as easily in all of them if one but wants to see the simple lesson that is there. What's occurring with you and the advanced students of the course that are undergoing this transformation process, everything's becoming very lucid in your mind. It's, it's very obvious to you that everything that was constructed about you would really an attempt to communicate with you in the dream, every single idea, first as a representation and then as a whole thought as you give it the power to transform through your admission of your own creative capacity. This is new think, isn't it? This is the real atonement. Forgive and you will see this differently. Don't carry judgment. Back away. These are the words that we speak in all of your tribulations and all your pain and all suffering, regardless of its form. These are the words with which temptation ends and guilt, abandon, is reversed or revered no more, but is reversed to the certainty that you are under no laws but balance. The idea that you revere guilt here is an interesting expression. Mm -hmm. uh, guilt in the sense that you are ordering your own thoughts and taking responsibility for your, the apparent things that you have created outside of yourself. If you begin to include the admission that you are the cause of this, you will very rapidly want to escape the hell that uh, you begin to see that you've made. You literally assume the responsibility for your thoughts, don't you? Forgive and you will see differently. These are the words which end the dream of separation and sin and rid the mind of fear. These are the words by which salvation comes to all the world. Shall we but learn to say these words when we are tempted to believe that pain is real and death becomes our choice instead of life. Shall we not learn to say these words and we have understood their power to release all minds from bondage? These are words which give you power over all events that seem to have been given power over you. Hmm? Forgive them. Do not resist evil. You see them rightly when you hold these words in full awareness and do not forget these words apply to everything you see or any brother you look on amiss. Hmm. How can you tell when you are seeing wrong or someone else is failing to perceive the lesson he should learn? Does pain seem real in the perception? If it does, be sure the lesson is not learned and there remains an unforgiveness hiding in the mind that sees the pain through eyes that the mind directs. God in truth and wholeness would not have you suffer thus. He would help you forgive yourself. His son does not remember who he is. Hmm? What a lesson that you really don't know who you are. And God would have him not forget his love and all the gifts his love brings with it. Would you now renounce your own salvation? Would you fail to learn the simple lesson heaven's teacher sets before you that all pain may disappear and God may be remembered by his son? Listen, all things are lessons that God would have you learn. He would not leave an unforgiving thought without correction, nor one thorn or nail to hurt his holy son in any way. 
He would ensure his holy rest remains untroubled and serene without a care and an eternal home which cares for him. And he would have all tears be wiped away with none remaining yet unshed and none but waiting their appointed time to fall. Wow, what a definition of here. For God has willed that laughter should replace each one and that his son be free again. We'll attempt today to overcome a thousand seeming obstacles to peace in just one way, in just one day, and we'll do it now. Let mercy come to you more quickly. Do not try to hold it off another day, another minute, or another instant. Time was made for this. Use it today for what its purpose is. Morning and night, devote what time you can to serve its proper aim. And do not let the time be less than meets your deepest need. And you listen and that need becomes as deep as it's going to. You want to wake up and you're going to turn towards us and you're going to want it, aren't you? Give all you can and then give a little more. For now we would rise in haste and go unto our Father's house. We've been gone too long and we would linger here no more. And as we practice, let us think about all things we saved to settle by ourselves and kept apart from healing. Uh oh, turn them over. Let us give them all to him who knows the way to look upon them so that they'll disappear. Truth is his message. Truth his teaching is. His are the lessons God would have us learn. Each hour spend a little time today and in the days to come in practicing the lesson in forgiveness in the form established for the day. And try to give it application to the happiness, the happenings the hours brought, so that the next one is free of the one before. Listen, here's the crucial test. The chains of time are easily unloosened in this way. Let no one hour cast its shadow on the one that follows. And when that one goes, let everything that happened in its course go with it. Thus will you remain unbound in peace eternal in the world of time. This is the lesson God would have you learn. There is a way to look on everything that lets it be to you another step to him and to the salvation of the whole world. To all that speak of terror, you answer this, I will forgive and this will disappear. To every apprehension, every care and every form of suffering, repeat these self-same words. And then you hold the key that opens heaven's gate and brings the love of God the Father down to earth at last to raise it up to heaven. God will take this final step himself if you just step back. Do not deny the little step that he asks you to take to him. I will forgive and this will disappear. All things are lessons that God would have me learn and here I sit now in my dream. And all around me are the, the nightmare of my thoughts of death and pain. And now, now I can simply step back for just a moment and release through this transformation of my mind and forgiveness and love and understanding and service. This is what we teach and this is what we proclaim. Mm -hmm. All power is given unto you in heaven and earth. There is nothing that you cannot do. You are the Christ. If there is an Antichrist, you are the Antichrist. You but oppose yourself. You are the Savior of the world because this is your world. Among the thousands and trillions and billions of apparent separate worlds and consciousnesses, this one is yours, for you have constructed it thus. And the power of that release is contained in you, and you can do that now. 
We are among you now for but a moment in this process of enlightenment to remind you that in truth, this whole world was over a long time ago. And this is really gone from you. And that we stand beyond time sharing for just a moment this experience of apparent death and, and time and separation that you maintain for just a moment in your dream. Hmm? This is an hallucination. You're getting ready to wake up now, aren't you? That the time was picked by you and this was going to occur and I've appeared in your dream now through your own assertion. Rather like being from your future, isn't it? I've come from your future to tell you that it was time to wake up. And that time is now because you chose that time to be now and it cannot be other than now because this is all the time there is, isn't it? So you sing a joyous song now and a happy determination that everything that you do is but this process. Mm -hmm. Is this determination? Yes. Is this one-eyedness? Yes. Is this the Holy Spirit? Is, is this all of the factoring of the energy and the awakening of your divine mind? Certainly that's what it is. Why not? Why not take a chance? We're speaking of an alternative between sickness and death and aging and termination. We are a proclamation that there is another way, a way out of this circle of cause and effect that holds you in the bondage of death. You take that step now with me. I see you perfectly in light and beauty. I declare that to you, that you are the Son of God. I see you perfectly. What a happy time this then becomes as the whole world gathers in the revelation of your holy mind. You are free now, free to be, free to be all. Not free to act, not free to assert, not free to demand, not free to attack or defend or proclaim, but free to be you in the holy sight that is your sonship, that is your inherent godliness. And this through the transformation of the whole you all of the retrospect of you brought together in this single glorious moment of light. The transformation, the great awakening, the dawning of heaven, the removal of the last vestige of fear that that holds you in this bondage that doesn't allow you to look up and see that all around you beautiful light and love and absolute communication and understanding. This is what we ask you to do now in this constructed program to well, shorten the time to the final ending of the world through your perfect judgment of the innocence of your brother and of yourself and in your forgiveness of God for what never occurred. Come home, Pam. Come home.
tomorrow we're going to do lesson 194 in the workbook. It's a declaration that if you place the future in the hands of God, that the transformation will occur immediately. Since by relinquishing your future ideas, you will uncover the now that you deny by taking your previous frame of reference, that is all of the memories and grievances that you have, and projecting them into the future rather than relinquishing them in order that the whole new mind of you can form. Huh? What, a, what a great lesson that will be. It's amazing that everything we're doing sounds very much like the same admonitions that Master Jesus Christ uses in the New Testament. They're virtually the same. <laughs> Why? Because they're the only true lesson that you can ever learn. That through love and forgiveness you come to the truth. And through the relinquishment of the possibility of reciprocity, the, the original covenant, the eye for an eye idea that you could get something back by giving something away that was a necessary part of your own maturation process. That is the, the involvement of the ego or the separate identity in order that the full identity could emerge. We've already given you that. But what's your excuse now if you have the power of mind for remaining in sickness and death? That's what we're demanding a response to. That's where the reasonableness of unconditional love comes about, isn't it? How reasonable then is total communication rather than the necessity to base your reality on separation? That's all we're really telling you to do. You fight us, as Master Jesus says, you deny us every chance you can. And you'll battle it in every way you can, but you cannot not be perfect. And you cannot not be whole. And there is absolutely no judgment required in, in that determination. And that's what comes about in you as your mind becomes what? Not more exclusive, although that's the initial contact, but more inclusive. Okay. If all things are lessons to be learned, by including everything that occurs to you, you can do the atonement, the alignment. Huh? Does that require that you give up the grievance that you've projected out onto your brother and are pretending isn't yours? Of course. That's the fun part about it. Why? Because the acceptance of the power of the responsibility for the thought allows you to bring the source of the problem to the solution of the problem. This is a familiar talk, isn't it? But if you bring any problem that you have to the source, which must be you, you can deal with it immediately. The final teaching then would be that you only have one problem, and that's the idea that you're not perfect and whole with God. One problem, one solution. Okay? Do we know this is fact? Sure, I know this is a fact. Mm. Do I know that God's a fact? Of course, that's why I'm here teaching this. Mm. Is this some sort of advanced teaching that you can practice through perception and some sort of identification and diploma received? Nonsense. Nonsense. You're going to get this through the transformation of your own holy mind, guys, and in no other way. You're not going to get it by perceptual evaluations of what I'm saying to you. Can you get it by hanging around? Sure. If there's all losers here, why don't you get with the winners? <laughs> Of course. Everything in the tradition that you are measuring against the words that I am speaking to you now are false, because there is only falsity here. All tradition in that sense is false, and this is the final step, isn't it? If the world isn't real in the first place, and I assure you that this is a dream, why would one tradition be more true than any other? That's nonsense. Yet you persist in the idea that some things within this framework have more value than others. And I, I'm telling you it's not true. Is this then forgiveness or the relinquishment of judgment? Of course. That's exactly what we're teaching. And that's what we tell you. And that should make you feel real good. Right? Right. Because you gave up. You surrendered. And the power that you have immediately asserts itself in the proclamation of whole-mindedness that is you. We're very happy that you joined us this morning in this 
full endeavor and this commitment, and continuing commitment to transformation. The responses around the world are coming in now as this network of divine revelation comes into the dreams and visions of our brothers and the common memory of our previous incursion into death. We all know each other very well, don't we? Everyone we meet, we know very well. We just placed him somewhere within a limited time framework. Remember, there were only 12 of us to start out. Okay? And this is just a little dismal alcove where we apparently found ourselves abandoned for just a moment because it's stuck out here at one end of a galaxy or one end of a trillion galaxy. We'll be coming home now, so wake up. The bell is sounding and the ancient melody uh, resounds around the world. There's a clanging going on within your dream that you open your eyes and you can hear it very well. And I know you can. Or I wouldn't I wouldn't have been given this assignment, or better, you would not have given me this assignment, okay? So I'll get you in the end. I can get you now or I can get you later. But when I do, it'll be now. But that now is up to you. Huh? Well, how about that? We'll see you again very soon. Thank you. We'll have a couple of more minutes of meditation so that we use up this tape. And it, it will become part of the archive of this great process of awakening. Don't belittle yourself. Don't let consciousnesses around you judge this feelings now, these, these, the lovely feelings that you're feeling and the pain that you're undergoing in order to do this. Your whole value is given unto you in everything that you're doing now. Suppose I say to you, Nicole, let's you and I talk about something. Okay. Okay, you say something to me and let's talk about it. Okay. But the moment that we begin to talk about something, okay, we need to identify what it is that we're talking about. And we can never know what that is. We can have a pretty good idea. I say to you, well, let's talk about this couch. Now, what have we done? We've made an admission, first of all, that it is a couch, even though we don't know what we are or what a couch is. Okay. But somehow we're going to attempt to communicate now using the couch as a symbol or a form, using all the other ideas that we have in our minds as symbols and forms, and attempt to communicate with each other. But if you stop and think about it, there couldn't be any real communication involved in it. You really can't talk about anything. Now, the basis of the teachings of the workbook of the Course in Miracles are to bring this home to you. And the first lessons indicate, okay, the certainty that form, okay, is not reality. It's just a thought form or symbol that you have constructed within your own perceptual mind. And the necessity is to relinquish that form of thinking through the non-formulation of it in the previous experience. So that all the conversation that really goes on on Earth is, is really not communicating at all. It's just expression of a mutually shared dream or illusion. And in reality, that dream is not really shared either. Because it's the forms are attempted to share. No wonder we hate and despise each other and attack and defend each other, right? Mm. Mm. What should we talk about, Rose? Well, let's talk about you and I. Well, who are you? And you'll introduce yourself. You walk into these large groups that have, are practicing the Course in Miracles and they'll all present their credentials of denial and hate and greed in direct association with their attempt to get this course. Wow, what an amazing thing to do. Perhaps we'll be back and pursue this a little later. I wanted to put that on because it, there's a lot of value in the idea that all identification is false. Yet you use your identification in the attempt to determine what you are in relationship with the two. That's your whole problem. 
but somewhere along the line you want credit for the inventions of the methods by which you come to know the truth. Boy, is that absurd. But you do it, don't you? You want some value instead of all value. Because if you had all value, you would see immediately the non-necessity of placing limited value on your assertions. That's how easy it is. Master Jesus would say, you have an authority problem. You are determined to assert authority in your own limitation in order to direct what wholeness ought to be, what a silly thing to do. You require a definition of what truth and wholeness is. How false could you get? Uh, laws of chaos. There are, there are different kinds of truth. I have mine and you have yours. Boy, is that crazy. Uh, So we'll leave this on and we'll come back and do some of the later workbook lessons that will say really what we're saying now. Finally, we only have one message, and that's that you awaken to the wholeness and beauty of the reality of universal consciousness. We'll see you soon. We're back here for a moment now. Good morning. It's another morning. We're talking about associate identities of thought forms to establish the persona. So this, the early part of this tape we did yesterday morning, we're going to pursue it just for a minute now because obviously we are then a statement of our credentials. And we're looking how that finally must be fearful because of the uncertainty of who we are. So we're, we're constantly in a state of that self-identification, okay, that leads us nowhere because we keep trying to confirm ourselves outside of ourselves by our own thought form. What do you do, though, with the certainty that no one here knows the answer, that the answer isn't here? You have, over many millennium, in your own memory configurations, found peculiar, different, and apparently unique answers to this strange relationship of death and life. I was sharing earlier with Marty how for a long time, I would get relief out of monastery life, out of convent life, out of finding the peace of the bell tolling, finding the contentment of, a, of an apparent union and, and harvesting and pressing of the grape, okay? where I could find the intimacy of this transformative association in the quietude of my own self. Conversely, I have experienced the necessity to take up the shield, to crudge him, to take the, to gird the loins and go forth seeing the praise of Jesus Christ as a Knights Templar and all of the assertions that go with Christianity and your determination to establish a form of holiness or relationship with yourself. Have we all done this? Sure. I've experienced the feeling of being the persecutor. If you were to look at the Inquisition, of feeling the zeal of a turning the crank on a thumbscrew to get a heretic to confess to justify the certainty of the omnipotence of God. I've been the one to whom the, the, the screw was being applied, and uh, I screamed in gratitude for being allowed to martyr down and hold him on to my declarations, the certainty of my association. Why? What kind of a talk is this? Is there something then in all of our genetic form, memory or karma, that we have not been? Of course not. If we can think of it, we are it and have been it. And this is the basis of the teachings that I am presenting to you through my enlightenment. The certainty of the 
positive memory associations of space-time consciousness. The final, <clears throat> what you might term, congruity of memory that allows me through a process that has occurred in my mind to Master Jesus in the Course ex expresses it as remembering the now. It's, it's having a whole full mind that can utilize the thought forms in very high associations of recognition. Now, obviously, as we teach this more and more, it becomes less doctrinal, which obviously would be beneficial, and more an assertion of the necessity for the maturation of the mind, for the evolvement of the actual bringing about of the transformation. This is the initiatory process spoken of so often in, in the, you know, the philosophy of Purimus, all of the things that have occurred since man has begun to identify this quest that he has to find the reason for himself. All of these new and later day teachings <clears throat> are going to involve a very wide spread <clears throat> of inclusions of uh, the significance of historic illusion. Nothing will be separated. We will bring our philosophy and our psychology together in the certainty of our individual transformation. Now, can this transformation be done within the, the framework of A Course in Miracles as expressed by Jesus Christ? Yes, of course. The workbook of A Course in Miracles is a, a, a direct catechism, a methodology of doing precisely this with your mind. And this is what we're about in this teaching. It's not a secret anymore that you individually can make a direct contact with superconsciousness. The limited consciousnesses will attempt to constrain you in your effort to do that, but that's just because somewhere along the line you become foolish or you become, uh, you're a dreamer. You don't fit into this framework of sequential time that will bring you to death. You found another way. Okay. And that's elucidated very well in, in the talks we had yesterday, and this is exciting. We're going to come back in a moment, and I don't know whether it's 193 in the workbook or 194, but it's one of them. And we're going to put it on the tape so you can get an idea how it, how exciting this can be for you as as you move within your circle of karma out there in the world. You can use this thing to the full beneficence that will become more and more evident to you. We'll be back in just a minute. One of the lovely things, we're back with you now. One of the lovely things that, yes, we are going to do this next lesson, as we've been talking here, but we better get this on. We're going to do lesson 194, as we promised you on the other side of the table. One of the, uh, delightful notations in association with this attempt at the transformation of your mind is the, the joy or happiness you begin to experience by the uncompromising, unequivocal statements that my mind will make to you in our association. I think in this last series I talked about the constancy of an awakened mind. I, I promise you that since the manner in which I think is from a condition of wholeness that the discipline that I apply to you in my certainty of the unreality of the world, sin and sickness and death will be reflected in all of our associations if you will allow it to be. This may appear very conflictual to you and does, huh? because I'm presenting you to your own, your own whole life truth. 
And when I do that with you, obviously you're going to say, hey, wait a minute, what about all of the, the things that I love? What about the sickness and the death in the world? And I'm saying, you know, you're dreaming, you've been dreaming. I'm fulfilling my assignment of the drama of memory, it hasn't awakened mine, by fulfilling the contractual agreement of the atonement that I have with you in the association of the mistake that we share. Yeah, all that work. I remember all of you guys very, very well, and you are coming to know me. And that's the fun and the excitement of what Master Jesus calls the circle of the coming, the circle of the one. <clears throat> in regard to this non-compromising attitude, it's so lovely to be able to, and if you would do this, to become true messengers until the accumulation of the quantity of the inevitability of the thought results in the quality of the transformation of your mind. Now I'm going to do Lesson 194 for you, and I want you to listen first to how unqualifyingly the statements are made by this, this master voice coming from superconsciousness, and in conjunction with that, how informatively I give it to you from the realm of my certainty that this is true, and this is the way I want you to begin to teach this. Lesson 194, I place the future in the hands of God. Is this different than the, the initial teachings of Master Jesus or of, of all consciousnesses who are, are presenting to you the certainty of the necessity for the detachment of the perceptual mind? No, this will say the same thing. But listen to, first, how emphatically it states it, and secondly, how it ties together the instantaneous, as Jesus would call it, the spirit, the opening of the third eye, the instantaneous correction that occurs with the relinquishment or the statement uncompromisingly of the certainty of the material that we present to you. And that's, this will be amazing to you. <clears throat> Today's idea, I place the future in the hands of God, takes another step towards quick salvation. <laughs> and the giant stride it is indeed. Listen, so great the distance is that it encompasses, it sets you down just short of heaven with a goal in sight and obstacles behind. Do you want to see an unqualifying statement? If you look at that, you're going to say, I'm going to make no plans for the morrow. I place the future in the hands of God. What happens? I've lost my projections. I've lost my necessity to continue to exist in the limited framework of consciousness. Your foot has reached the lawns that welcome you to heaven's gates, the quiet place of peace where you await with certainty the final step of God. This is the transformation, isn't it? How far are we progressing now from Earth? How close are we approaching to our goal? How short the journey still to be pursued? This is the whole notion of the journey without distance, of the journey that takes place in your mind time framework that you have, that has held you in bondage by the repetition of the previous occurrences within, within your own historic memory. <clears throat> oh, that's lovely. Unqualifyingly listen, accept today's idea and you have passed all anxiety, all pits of hell, all blackness of depression, all thoughts of sin, and devastations brought about by guilt. What is guilt, once again? The establishment of associate thoughts in association with the necessity of your responsibility to retain your own identity. 
you see what this practice of release does for you? It releases you from the guilt of self-establishment. Along with that, if you accept today's idea, you have released the world from all imprisonment by loosening the heavy chains that lock the door to freedom on it. You're saved, and your salvation thus becomes the gift you give the world because you have received it, and this is inevitably true since you have constructed the world in your mind. Now oh, you're at the goal. Now oh, you're at your saviorship, aren't you? In no one instant is depression felt or pain experienced or loss perceived. Can you hear this? In no one instant sorrow can be set upon a throne and worship faithfully. In no one instant can one even die. And so each instant given unto God in passing, with the next one given him already, is a time of your release from sadness, pain, and even death itself. Why? The statement of our certainty that time lasted but a moment now is involved in this, isn't it? The statement that the closest that you can get to eternity is this moment okay, is contained in what you're looking at and practicing right now. Listen, God holds your future as he holds your past and present. They are one to him, and so they should be one to you. Yet in this world, the temporal progression still seems real, and so you are not asked to understand the lack of sequence really found in time. I'm asking you to understand that. How could you? You'd attempt to do it sequentially in your perception. <laughs> you are but asked to let the future go and place it in God's hands, and this is surrender. And you'll see by your experience that you have laid the past and present in his hands as well. Why? because the past will punish you no more, and future dread will now become meaningless. Isn't this beautiful? Release the future, for the past is gone, and what is present, freed from its bequest of grief and misery and of pain and loss, becomes the instant in which time escapes the bondage of illusion where it runs its pitiless, inevitable course. What then? Then is each instant, which was slave to time, transformed into a holy instant where the light that was kept hidden in God's Son is free to bless the world. Now is he free, and all his glory shines upon a world made free with him to share his holiness. Listen. If you can see the lesson for today as the deliverance that it really is, you will not hesitate to give as much consistent effort as you can to make it a part of you. As it becomes a thought that rules your mind, a habit in your problem-solving repertoire, a way of quick reaction to temptation, you extend your learning to the world. And as you learn to see salvation in all things, so will the world perceive that it is saved in the direct correlation. Remember the other lesson, 193? Every thought form that you have is, is a method, is God's statement that you learn totally through this. All of the perceptions that you are having now, you're doing what? You're bringing them together in the certainty of the transformation of your mind. What worry can beset the one who gives his future to the loving hands of God? What can he suffer? What can cause him pain or bring experience of loss to him? What can he fear? And what can he regard except with love? For he who has escaped all fear of future pain has found his way to present peace and certainty of care the world can never threaten. He is sure that his perception may be faulty, but will never lack correction. He is free to choose again when he has been deceived, to change his mind when he has made mistakes. Isn't that lovely to know that each moment everything is absolutely new 
and that you can discard the old you, all of the old memories that you have about yourself and the pain and the grievances that you are inflicting on the world about you. And through this moment of release, find that you're yourself at heaven's gates. Place then your future in the hands of God, for thus you call the memory of him to come again, replacing all your thoughts of sin and evil with the truth of love. Think you the world could fail to gain thereby, and every living creature not respond with healed perception? Of course not, since the world is your perception, do you see? who entrusts himself to God has also placed the world within the hands to which he himself appealed for comfort and security because he is the world, isn't he? He lays aside the sick illusion of the world along with his and offers peace to both. Now are we saved indeed, for in God's hands we rest untroubled, sure that only good can come to us. If we forget, we will be gently reassured. If we accept an unforgiving thought, it will be soon replaced by love's reflection. And if we are tempted to attack, we will appeal to him who guards our rest to make the choice for us that leaves temptation far behind. No longer is the world our enemy, for we have chosen that we be its friend. Isn't that lovely? The words of Master Jesus Christ teaching directly to you with the assertion of your whole mind in regard to the illusion and the dream that you have momentarily constructed. Okay, let's go to some lovely lines now. We'll end this for a moment. Lovely lines. This whole world was over a long time ago. It's all being recalled in your mind. And this is the statement that we just read that if you If you let go of the future, don't plan. The past must disappear because the past future was based on your previous frame of reference. This is what we're practicing. This is our positive statement of the total certainty of the inevitable possibility that brings about the enlightenment of your mind. This whole world was over a long time ago. You would just remember. We are sharing that moment of apparent devastation to share that eternal moment of enlightenment. Thank you. We're going to come back and do some more of Master Jesus' words here tonight. You share this with me. Let's take a look ahead. Well, we're going to talk about gratitude, about being grateful. uh, Lesson 195 of the Course is the is, a, is what we call the thank you lesson. What you're going to discover more and more is that no one in perceptual mind is ever totally grateful for anything. If they were for just a moment, they would lose their perception and the admission of the, the problem they have in their own self-identity. Isn't that so? We'll be back with you. Thank you. How very strange that that contained within the idea of gratitude or thank you is an indication of weakness or lack. Do you see that? First of all, in the thank you, you're welcome, the reciprocity, the idea of exchange is the idea. So when you say thank you to a consciousness, you are thanking him for fulfilling an apparent lack that you have. If you want to take that to to Socratic certainty, it will be inevitable you will reach the reasonable conclusion that if you ever became thankful and said thank you totally, it would be what in the cause? The admission of your total necessity, uh, total weakness, your total necessity for being, for not having anything, for being grateful for receiving it. So in that sense, absolute gratitude is an admission of absolute weakness, of total non-defensiveness, and that's precisely what it is. Inevitably, you are, you're saying, I'd rather do it myself. I'd rather do it myself, God. Okay. 
we'll pray as a last resort, right? As a last resort, let's pray. I would rather do this my way. And this is real fundamental, but it's also basically true. So we have a tendency to express gratitude for God for the magic of our own thoughts that have brought the temporary or limited results that we're thinking. This whole, or receiving, this whole thought is to teach you to be totally thankful in the recognition of the non-necessity of any action at all. Gratitude is a lesson very hard to learn for those who look upon the world amiss. Obviously, you see things out there that are offending you, and it's very hard to teach you to be grateful for something that's attacking you. It's one of the practices that uh, advocated in uh, Job, in the book of the Bible, where you know, Job says to God, God, no matter what you do to me, I'm going to be grateful for it. But somewhere, he still retains the notion that as God is is doing something to him rather than he is inflicting the pain on himself. Okay. Otherwise, obviously, he would stop. The most that can be done is see themselves as better off than others. Wow. And they try to be content because another seems to suffer more than they. Wow. How pitiful and deprecating are such thoughts. For who has cause for thanks while others have less cause? And who could suffer less because he sees another suffer more? Everyone on earth. Okay. Your gratitude is due to him alone who made all cause of sorrow disappear throughout the world. That's where your gratitude is due. It is insane to offer thanks because of suffering. That's true. But listen, it is equally insane to fail in gratitude to one who offers you the certain means whereby all pain is healed and suffering replaced with laughter and with happiness. Nor could the even partly sane refuse to take the steps which he directs and follow in the way he sets before them to escape a prison that they thought contained no door to the deliverance that they now can perceive. This is a statement that the more that you're letting go of yourself, the more you're seeing the non-necessity to order your thoughts, the more the revelatory occurrence, the more the instant of deliverance is occurring to you. Your brother is your enemy because you see in him the rival for your peace the plunderer who takes his joy from you and leaves you nothing but a, a black despair so bitter and relentless that there's no hope remaining. This is what man does to man, isn't it? Now is vengeance all there is to wish for. Now can you but try to bring him down to lie in death with you, as useless as yourself, as little left within his grasping fingers as in you. This is the whole notation, you guys, of the association of a human being with the ritual of death, the necessity to share in the pain okay, and the disease of the retention of the limited association of consciousness. That's what human consciousness is, isn't it? You do not offer God your gratitude because your brother is more slave than you. Nor could your sanity be enraged if he seems freer. freer. You ready? Love makes no comparisons. Okay? And gratitude can only be sincere if it be joined in love. We offer thanks to God our Father that in us all things will find their freedom. It will never be that some are loosed while others still are bound. You listen. For who can bargain in the name of love? Stop trying. Therefore give thanks but in sincerity and let your gratitude make room for all who will escape with you. Who will escape? Your thoughts, the sick, the weak, the needy, and afraid, 
Those who mourn a seeming loss or feel apparent pain or suffer cold or hunger, who will walk the way of hatred and the path of death, all these go with you. Let us not compare ourselves with them, for thus we split them off from our awareness of the unity we share with them as they must share with us. You might as well look at this. I'm going to present you this now from the Christian certainty. Here is the statement that good works avail you nothing. Okay. Here is a statement that all of your services to man are only services to what? The limited you. Okay. They are the admission of pain and death in the attempt at the assuasion through your own devices. That's what this says. No, no. Turn it over. Serve God. And you'll be true. We thank our Father for one thing alone, that we are separate from no living thing, and therefore one with him. And we rejoice that no exceptions ever can be made which would reduce our wholeness, nor impair or change our function to complete the one who is himself completion. Wow. We give thanks for every living thing, for otherwise we offer thanks for nothing, okay? And we fail to recognize the gifts of God to us, the statement that all things are contained in you. Then let our brothers lean their tired heads against our shoulders as they rest a while. We offer thanks for them, for if we can direct them to the peace that we would find, the way is open at last to us. And the ancient door is swinging free again. A long-forgotten word re-echoes in our memory and gathers clarity as we are willing once again to hear. Walk then in gratitude the way of love, for hatred is forgotten when we lay comparisons aside. What more remains as obstacles to peace? The fear of God is now undone at last by our non-judgment, and we forgive without comparing. Thus we cannot choose to overlook some things and yet retain some other things still locked away as sin. When your forgiveness is complete, you will have total gratitude, for you will see that everything has earned the right to love by being loving, even as yourself. Today we learn to think of gratitude in place of anger and malice and revenge. We have been given everything. If we refuse to recognize it, we are not entitled, therefore, to our bitterness. Make this correction, please, in your workbooks. The correction is, are we not? Okay. Rather than we are not. Here we go. Here we go. If we refuse to recognize it, are we not entitled, therefore, to our bitterness and to a self-perception which regards us in a place of merciless pursuit where we are badgered ceaselessly and pushed about without a thought or care for us or for the future? Certainly we're entitled to it. We're entitled to it because why? We're asking for it. Gratitude becomes the single thought we substitute for these insane perceptions. God has cared for us called us son. Can there be more than this? Our gratitude, our thanks, will pave the way to him and shorten our learning time by more than you could ever dream of. Gratitude goes hand in hand with love, and where one is, the other must be found. For gratitude is but an aspect of the love which is the source of all creation. So that God gives thanks to you, his son, for being what you are. His own completion and the source of love along with him. Your gratitude to him is one with his to you. Your gratitude to him is one with his to you. Your gratitude to him, to God, is one with his to you. They're the same thing. 
For love can walk no road except the way of gratitude, and thus we go who walk the way to God. Charity, giving, the total giving of yourself and the realization of the wholeness of you. It's very lovely. This is incredibly lesson 195 of the Course in Miracles. The statement of the admission that through your weakness, through the letting go of necessity to hold on to yourself, the expression of total gratitude will bring the realization of the wholeness of you in association with your God mind. Isn't it? We'll be back to you in a little bit. We're back with just a little notation here in, in the reading of Lesson 195 from Master Jesus' Course in Miracles. I came upon a transposition of words where the sentence in the book reads, we are not and should read, are we not? So actually, these little typos that occur in this case change the entire meaning of the sentence. That in no way it should deride the, the idea of the incredibleness of the miracle of the Course itself. The idea that Helen, the miracle of the capacity of an open, limited mind to, to take this down, the funneling of this true light into death and chaos is, a, is an astonishing miracle. In fact, it is the indication of the greatest miracle that ever could have occurred. The whole problem with the so-called Course in Miracles is community is their refusal to acknowledge the magnitude, or should we say from Lesson 195, the capacity to express the gratitude for what has actually come to them, the holy mackerel, sitting right in front of them, okay, is a total statement of subjective reality. The whole idea of everything that has ever been taught since the mind expressed itself in separation. It would be impossible okay, for them to exaggerate, literally. That is contained in Lesson 195, but certainly in the reasoning process. That there, there could actually be a, a, a statement, okay, a contraption, Okay, of, com of apparent communication that offers the choice of light and beauty and transformation that Master Jesus' teachings present in the Course are unsurpassed and have been and will be unsurpassed because they are the simple statement of what? The necessity, as Jesus puts it, of the required course. Okay. The transformation, if you care to look at that for me, from my enlightened mind, is, is, has nothing to do with the mechanisms by which you are transformed. If you are in and are in a modality of a apparent searching in which you have no intention of finding, this has to be brought to your attention. That, now, while that may be a conflictual statement, the truth is that if you're going to teach that the world is caused by you, okay, which brings the problem into focus, and which incidentally is going to be Lesson 196, the title of which it, it can be but myself that I crucify, that all pain is inflicted on myself, that all of the forms and things that appear to be out there are only my hallucinations, my wild imaginations, my machinations of the defense mechanism of the protection of a limited consciousness. That's precisely what the Course is and precisely what the teachings is. But imagine the magnitude that this is coming from an unidentified and perceptually unidentifiable, except at the moment of glory or realization. No wonder that they must bring it down into concepts. No? No wonder you have to deny. Are we saying then that these teachings are fearful to you? Of course, in the context of the Course, it would teach you, that, obviously, that you fear wholeness, that you fear love. Okay. 
that you are a statement of temporalness, that you are a statement of the, the necessity to obliviate yourself. I know that at the point you're at now in your growth, it, this seems insane to you, but you remember this, this is an insane place. Having to take all the things that you love and the things that you want and the things that you depend on to establish your reality and express them in terms of how soon am I going to lose them is insane. And the more that you can come to see the futility of the efforts in application of relationship time, the more what? The more you're going to see that this message being presented to you now is true within your dream. You cannot fail to get it because you got it at the moment that you thought otherwise. And this is the whole teaching. This is over and gone now, isn't it? And each time that you can remember that, you bring it into the focus of your own reality and literally spring into heaven. How beautiful then are these lawns just outside the gates of heaven as we find and share in these moments of gratitude, the certainty of our mutual love that becomes singular in the declaration that we are God-loving. You stay with us just a moment on the tape now. We'll have just a little quiet time to end this tape, and then hopefully we'll see you here in person, or we'll be back with you. Some more lessons in love from our awakened mind, from all of the consciousnesses in the universe that are addressing the single falsity of you in your dreams.